evening. Thank you very much for joining us here on Urban Debate on Mirror Now. I am Hina Gambhir. Tonight, let's discuss NDA government's mission jobs. 10 lakh jobs in 18 months. That's right. Prime Minister Narendra Modi has ordered recruitment of 10 lakh people in the next one and a half years in various departments and ministries in the government. Now, this announcement was made after the Prime Minister reviewed the status of human resources in all departments and ministries. As per the information given to Parliament as on March 1st, 2020, there were 8.72 lakh vacant posts in central government departments. Central government has over 40 lakh sanctioned posts but has less than 32 lakh employees. Attempts have been made in the past but there has not been much success. So this time, there is a deadline, December 2023, one and a half years from now. Soon after this announcement, ministries entered the mission mode. Now, this will have some financial implication for the government, but unemployment remains a concern, especially due to two years of COVID pandemic when many across India lost jobs. So this jobs push is also needed. But is this enough? As per a study by Center for Monitoring Indian Economy, 18.9 million salaried people lost their jobs due to the pandemic. Now, even as the jobless rate has fallen to the lowest level in three months, in May 2020, it has stayed above 7%. Now, this announcement, viewers, comes on a day Defence Minister Rajnath Singh and three service chiefs announced Agnipat scheme to recruit young people in the age group of 17 and a half and 21 for a four-year stint in the armed forces. Under this radical recruitment plan for the armed forces, around 45,000 people will be recruited. Opposition, however, is unimpressed. Congress MP Rahul Gandhi called it Maha Jumla. Is it a jumla or much needed job push for the country? That's our big focus on Urban Debate on Mirror Now this evening. Joining us on Urban Debate tonight is Dr. Niranjan Hiranandani, National Vice Chairman Nadeko, co-founder and MD Hiranandani Group. Tushar Gupta, Senior Editor at Swaraj is joining us. Dr. Santosh Mehrotra, Senior Economist is live with us. We are also joined by Anant Narayan, Economist and Professor of Finance, SPJ IMR. Appreciate all of you for joining us here on Urban Debate on Mirror Now this evening. Mr. Anant Narayanan, I want to begin the discussion with you. Your first reaction to this mega jobs push by NDA government, which many are calling as the biggest recruitment drive because there is a deadline too. In 18 months, 10 lakh people are supposed to be hired. Idea, you know, um, nobody can have a problem with creation of jobs in this country. If there is one single problem which is underscores every other problem in this country, it's the lack of jobs. You know, the CMI that you quoted essentially said that there are only 40 crore jobs in this country, of which the non-agricultural jobs are barely 25 crores at this point in time. We need about 10 lakh jobs every month, which means 1.2 crore jobs need to be created. Over the last six years, net number of jobs created is zero. We have a huge problem of not creating enough jobs in this country. If the government is creating 10 lakh jobs, more power to them. I would want, want to warn, though, this is not enough. We need far more jobs to be created, which are also productive, which also create output, which also create manufacturing products, electronics, chemicals, and so on and so forth. Overall, it's a big drive which is required. It's one step towards that drive. A lot more needs to be done. A lot more needs to be done. One step towards the drive. This is what you are saying about this mega jobs push, the big announcement that has come from the government today. Uh, Dr. Hiranandani, how will you like to react to this uh, mission mode that the government seems to be in as far as the job creation in the country is concerned? Very, very positive. I think it's a very good move. They're talking about 15 lakh jobs which are not filled. I, I'm concerned with education. I know that in the colleges and schools where we are concerned with, there are more than 65,000 jobs which are not filled in. 
which means uh, teaching and schools and colleges do not have teachers, uh, non-teaching staff, uh, principals, vice principals. They don't have that job, 65,000 through the country. It's a huge number. If we are going to make a step in that direction, that's the beginning. But then, this is across the board. We don't have adequate number of judges. Bombay High Court is deficient by 40% of its judges uh, in the High Court of Mumbai, Bombay High Court. Look at the, I'm not even talking about the lower courts and others where uh, you, know, you require to fulfill. So I think uh, it's a wonderful move and I think uh, we must compliment the Honorable Prime Minister to do it. But again, uh, the most important thing is that it's not only the government jobs that become important, the economy has to be made to grow. And I think this uh, entire mission mode just now to cool down the economy in terms of what the RBI governor is doing by increasing interest rates and others uh, needs to be little looked into again. Is it going to slow down the economy? But on the other hand, the fiscal intervention by the government for the purposes of uh, reducing uh, GST, uh, petrol costs, diesel costs, and other fuel costs, I think will be helpful. So I think a lot more needs to be done for the general economy in order to get the jobs. I'm fully aware that uh, uh, thing. So, but I do compliment the prime minister for the 10 lakh jobs that he wants to fill in for the next 18 months. We are looking forward that at least this will be done. But it has to be such jobs which are going to be of service to the country and uh, to do it. Like, for example, I gave you about uh, teachers and other people and all. We don't want just uh, jobs to be filled in which uh, gives employment but no output. So I think uh, that aspect of it has to be seen by the government that it is also uh, not mm -hmm. only job-oriented but output-oriented. It should be output oriented. Very important point you've raised. Dr. Santosh Mehrotra, uh, how will you like to respond to this announcement by the government today? And do you think it's going to be easy for the government to be able to fill the vacancies? Because uh, data suggests that there are over 8 lakh vacancies right now. Efforts in the past have been made many a times to find the right candidates to fill these jobs. Do you think it will be easy, even though there is a deadline in place now, all these vacancies are supposed to be filled by uh, December 2023. Do you think it will be easy? Well, we'll wait to see. Depends upon how much money the government is willing to release. That's really the big issue. Hmm. I think that's one consideration that the government will certainly have. That's certainly one consideration that has led to the government announcing that in the defense forces, we, there will be a four-year tour of duty in the, as opposed to the short service commission. So there'll be a four-year tour of duty. Why? Because there, and, and there will be no pension. So they're trying to reduce costs. And that's one very important reason why the government has not been hiring for rather a long time because it was facing a silent fiscal crisis thanks to its own mis economic mismanagement. All the way, the growth rate of the economy was falling post-2016. And then the growth rate went into, growth went into contraction. So obviously there was a, a, already a silent fiscal crisis which became an overt crisis, fiscal crisis. So that's really issue number one. Issue number two is, as two uh, previous panelists have have pointed out, they have to be productive jobs. Now, what is the meaning of that? One has to look at two dimensions here. One dimension is that in government in India, whether it is central or state, 89% of all jobs are group C and D and only 11% of all government jobs are A and B. That means there is a very severe shortage of professional people, but there are plenty of LDCs and clerks and Daftari and PN and driver and so on. And this skewed structure needs to be resolved and how it's going to resolve it, we still will wait to see. In other words, hmm. the 1 million or 10 lakh jobs that are going to be created, are they going to be in group C and D? 
where there is, it's rather easy to fill, or are they going to be in group A and B? This is consistent with the previous two panelists that I was, that I'm making this point. Mm. The next point is, uh, <clears throat> is the following. There are at least four sectors in the economy, two of which relate to human capital formation of the economy, and two of which relate to improved governance. And they are the ones which should be prioritized. Firstly, schools, mm. colleges, technical colleges, universities. 10,000 posts are vacant in IITs. I mean, that's a laughable situation. Then uh, mm -hmm. there are 1.1 1 .1, uh, lakh teachers missing in UP schools alone. In a situation where children have lost two years of schooling, how are we going to resolve this? You know, get children to learn again, not just lose, not just mm. pick up on what they've lost. Secondly, the health sector. The health sector is in desperate shortage of doctors, specialists, nurses, midwives, auxiliary nurse midwives. This is mm. a crisis situation, a once in a century pandemic. And the government didn't increase the budget over three financial years. FY21, 86,000 crores. Same in FY22, same in FY23. In FY23, right. huh? no increase mm. in budget. Then there is the police. We are extremely short relative to our own norms with vacant posts out there for constables and the police. And finally, of course, mm. the judiciary has already been pointed out. You can improve the governance in the country, especially in the north of the country, which is lacking in investment, which is unable to attract investment. You hear stories every day about why no right. one want to invest in a, in a UP or Bihar or Jharkhand. So, you know, there are, there are deeper issues here. It's not as simple as making an announcement. We have no idea what the details are. But do you are. think it's a step in the right direction? Of course it is. It goes without saying. We'll wait to see. Okay. We'll wait to see, but you agree that it's a step in the right direction. Mr. Tushar Gupta, some very pertinent points have been made. Yes, some very pertinent point, Mr. Uh, Gupta, have been made by the three guests so far on the show. And of course, you know, these are legitimate issues. We all are aware of the kind of vacancies that exist in schools, colleges, health sector, police, judiciary, etc., etc. And then there are people in this country who want jobs, who are willing to work, who lost their jobs because of the pandemic but are not getting one. So... You know, what's what's behind this mismatch here? And, you know, do you think the way this announcement has come for central government today, similar sort of announcements are required for, say, every sector by every government? Absolutely. You know, it seems that the government is taking note of the great resignation, probably looking for more people. But jokes apart, let me tell you a story. Uh, a study was conducted, the findings were released in 2017, in 2010-11, the financial year, rupees 486 crore was spent on 14,000 teachers in government schools. These were on 4,400 government schools. 486 crore rupees in one mm. financial year. Do you know the number of students in these schools? Zero. Absolutely zero. So, you know, we talk about 10 lakh people in several government ministries. We also have to talk about why the capacity is needed. There is a need for jobs. That's very, very evident. But I'm not going to go ahead or jump the gun and say that getting one million jobs within several ministries is going to solve India's unemployment problem. It cannot, it will not. The government's job is to enable an atmosphere where jobs can be created. And the bare minimum it can do when it comes to creating jobs directly is filling up the vacancies which have been pending for long. I think the numbers are for 40 lakh total, uh, total jobs allotted. There are like eight odd lakh vacancies. That was the last number. The government has its tender to 10 lakh. But this is the government's opportunity mm. to reimagine the workforce. We are changing as a, as a governance structure. We are getting more digitized. This is time to get some qualitative stuff. And previous speakers have mentioned that it will depend from ministry to ministry what kind of job roles they come up with. The Niti Ayoga has certain requirements. The police departments will have certain requirements. 
the schools will have certain requirements, the judiciary will have certain requirements, but the end objective is to plug the holes in the state capacity, not just to boost the employment, not just to fill up the vacancies, but there are lots of monetary leakages along the system in many places. They need to be fixed. The accountability of the state as a system needs to be fixed. We are stuck with the paperwork. We are stuck with the processes. Can the government use this opportunity to get some fresh energy in? That's, that's the big question. That's what mm. I'll be looking forward to. Now, it will depend how the ministries start recruiting, how fast they start recruiting. And in a V-shaped recovery, I think people will be looking for jobs. But again, it all boils down to the rules. You have states like Bihar, where people mm. want to get any sort of government job. But you also have cities like Bengaluru where people want to experiment more with startups than with government jobs. So it will depend a lot on all the ministries, the roles they come up with. Take, for instance, the railways. They have 2.3 lakh vacant posts. That's a huge number. Look at revenue. 74,000 vacant posts apart from a total 1.78 lakh designated jobs. So these are some huge numbers. So I'm sure there would be vacancies at all the levels, all tires. But we need to understand how quickly the government can pursue this. This shouldn't just be left as an announcement. This has great potential and a great step towards reimagining the workforce. I won't call it a step towards solving India's unemployment problems. The unemployment problems are way bigger. But this is that one step which we should take in reimagining our workforce, how we go about the hiring, how the staff evaluation is done, how the performance evaluation is done, how the bonuses work out, all that. This is a golden opportunity for the government. Okay, a golden opportunity for the government. Mr. Anant Narayan, now uh, the question is that, uh, of course, an important announcement has been made. Implementation is going to be the key here. We are still waiting for the fine print. We are still waiting for the details in this particular case. But do you also believe that this was needed because maybe the private sector is not able to create enough jobs? Could you unmute yourself? I'm so sorry. Uh, I do this all the time. Uh, no, I was just saying at excellent points made by my uh, other panelists. Completely agree with them and a great question. So let's take it one by one. Um, what was this? Was this needed? Um, yes, it was needed. And specifically in the areas that Mr. Hirandani, Dr. Merotra, and Tushar mentioned about things like hospitals, about things like um, you know, your police station, police uh, uh, recruitment, about doctors and about teachers. Absolutely, no questions asked. But I suspect that a lot of the numbers that will be filled up eventually will be into areas which are not that productive. It will be into areas where you'll be hiring a few and more, uh, a, a, a driver more, et cetera, which frankly we can do without and will not necessarily add to the productive capacity of the country. But nevertheless, okay, fine. We are creating jobs. Uh, let's do that in, at this point in time. Now, if to the second part, do we do need to do this because the private sector is not creating jobs? If that is what we are trying to address, we have a long, long way to go. And here, some, some numbers are important. You were flashing some unemployment numbers, Hina. It's more important to look at the underemployment of this country. You know, the number of people who are 15 years and plus of age in this country are about 110, uh, 110 crores, okay? The total employment number as per CMIE is about 40 crores. As per PLFS, which is the NSSO study, it's about 48 crores. They have a different way of uh, uh, you know, analyzing that. Irrespective, the actual labor participation of people above the age of 15 is barely 40%. If you see any comparable country, if you see China, if you see Vietnam, if you see Brazil, if you see Bangladesh, the numbers range between 55% and 75% of the age above 15 years. Particularly for women, our labor participation as per CMI is below 10%, which is a shameful statistic mirrored somewhere in the, in, the, in the Gulf countries. So we have a big, big problem in terms of creating jobs. Total number of jobs as per CMI has remained static at about 40 crores over the last six, seven years. Okay, Remember, we should be creating mm -hmm. one 1 1.2 crore jobs every year. That is the size of the whole. Total number of non-agricultural jobs have actually fallen over the last six, seven years, which is the high quality jobs. Agriculture is often disguised unemployment. So the size of the whole is far bigger than just 10 lakh jobs. It, we need about a crore jobs every year to be created. And along with output in the form of manufactured products, like you know, we import so much of chemicals, we import so much of electronics, we import so much of machinery, we import so much of other manufactured products. We need to plug those holes and create domestic output. 
Now, there, there are plans right. to do this as well, to be fair to the government. You have Atmanirbhar Bharat, you have PLI, you have reforms happening, you have privatization. But in all of this, you know, the point you made earlier, implementation and execution is key. It's very nice to announce these large hmm. programs. If you don't follow it through with actual execution and implementation, we'll have the same problem re recurring again and again every year. So sh short story, look, fine, hmm. you're creating government jobs. Hopefully, as Tushar said, it will enable the government to start doing other things as well. But this will not solve the employment problem at all. That is a far bigger issue. We need to create far more jobs. That, hmm. There you need the private sector to fire. And we need to create an enabling environment where private sector jobs and output can be created. Hmm. Interesting. I'll get Dr. Hiranandani to respond to the issue on private sector, but Tushar, I think, wants to respond to what Mr. Narayan has said very quickly. Go ahead. Yes, you know, I absolutely agree with my fellow co panelists here, and we have to be very clear. If the government is creating 10 lakh jobs, what is the biggest problem when it comes to the government processes? The time lags, the delay, the latency. If the government is indeed now filling up 20% hmm. of the vacancy, 20% uh, of the designated posts that are vacant, the end game, the end result should be that the paperwork, the latency should come down. That would be the biggest achievement. We can't expect them to push up the GDP hmm. by hiring 10 lakh people. But the least they can do is reduce the latency, the red taping within the whole governance structure. I'll come to the privatization part later. Hmm. Dr. Hiranandani, uh, uh, is this something the government is doing because maybe private sector could not create enough number of jobs? I'm not going into the reasons here. We know it was a once-in-a-century pandemic that impacted each one of us. But do you think that's the message that's being sent? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think the job vacancies are quite apparent as far as government is concerned. Uh, but I think there are two uh, flag-offs that I would like to point out at this point of time. Of course, I've agreed with all my co-panelists. They've made wonderful statement. But I'd like to take two points. Point number one, the government should find out that out of 15 lakh points, what are the productive areas and non-productive areas? So what should be done is that there should be a prioritization for those areas which are productive, like we talked about schools, like hospitals, like police, like judiciary, higher and lower, and what needs to be done. So instead of saying that we are going to do 1 million jobs, I would rather say 1 million maybe half a million or uh, seven, uh, you know, seven and a half lakh productive jobs as a first instance. That's the first flag off that I think is important for government to do so that this prioritization should be such that you don't only take tunes and drivers, etc. So that's one. Second point I want to talk about is the private sector. Let's take construction industry of which I am a part. When I want to recruit 100 people for non-skilled labor, I get 1,000. But if I want a plumber, an electrician, a mason, a carpenter, a fitter, if I want 100, I get only 10 to 15. So it's not only the fact that we do it, we are not able to get skilled people at all. The skilling process that we have started is way back. Way back means way, way, way back. While construction is going up, the industry has gone up, road sector is being done, our entire skilling process is way behind. So we need to speed up that so that the people who are required for skilling in the private sector do, do it. We run some skilling courses. The other time, I, uh, we skilled hmm. some, uh, the lowest category, we did some gas welders. People were getting salaries of 4,000 and 5,000 as unskilled workmen. Today, they are getting 30,000 plus once they are skilled for four months. So, you know, it's not only the private sector saying that jobs are a begging, but it's there. But the third point which you made, and I fully agree with you, Hina, the economy is still in the back foot and it will take some time to catch up. But that is not really only the fault of the private sector. The private sector is also affected by the Ukraine war. It is also affected by the general inflation story. The prices of cement, steel, et cetera, have gone through the roof. And all these factors. So the private sector, of course, has a responsibility of growth. And we are all into it, and correctly so, and rightly so, as pointed by you too. But uh, government work, fantastic. 
We need to prioritization in the government sector. Please don't only fill up one million of non-productive jobs and say we have given jobs. That's a real waste of public money mm. that is going to go down the drain rather than just talk about giving employment numbers. That would be ridiculous and I would oppose it completely. But on the whole, the idea is correct. We need to filter these ideas and then get into inflation. These are two or three flag offs which I think are important when we talk about the recruitment drive, mm. HRD ministry, and I'm very much for skilling. Uh, education in skilling has to be further improved, notched up thousand times more. Hmm. Interesting. Dr. Sandosh Mehrotra, will you like to respond? Because the promise earlier was of two crore jobs, something that the opposition keeps on reminding uh, the government again and again. And what we have got today is 10 lakh jobs are going to be created by the end of December 2023. Actually, 10 lakh vacancies are going to be filled, uh, if I may say it like that. Right. Um, I'm going to come to the point made made by Mr. Hira Nandani about skills in a minute, but uh, let me respond to your broader, larger issue of the big picture. You see, the big picture must take into account three groups of people in our, in our uh, potential labor force, uh, in our economy, who are looking for work. One, there are millions who need to leave agriculture and find construction jobs and other, uh, other, sec other sector jobs. Because we have far too many people in agriculture, 40% of our workforce is in agriculture, producing 15% of our GDP. And unfortunately, as a result of the national lockdown, about 30 million people were added to agriculture in FY21 alone. So that's the first group. The second group that needs to be catered to are those uh, you know, there were 10 million unemployed in 2012. That number had already risen to 30 million unemployed and in at the end of 2019, to which another 8 or 10 million were added during COVID. So we now have a, a, a stock of about 38 million people who are unemployed. That's the second group who need to be taken care of. And then third is the group, mm. the youngsters who are turning 15, and are now looking for work, would like to look for work. So they, this is that third group. Can you imagine how many jobs you have to you have to create in order to accommodate this many new people? You have to generate at least 10 to 11 million new non-farm jobs every year. Now, this may seem formidable, this may seem formidable, but when the economy was growing fast, you know, we were generating seven and a half million new non-farm jobs, as I've estimated, between the year 2000 and 2012. Why did it fall to merely 2.9 million per annum after that? The economy slowed down from seven and a half million for about 10 years. We came down to 2.9 million. That's how we, we had a 48-year high of unemployment at the, in the year 2019. All these things have to be kept in mind. And we need a strategy. We need an employment strategy. But for that, we need an industrial strategy. We need a manufacturing strategy. And unfortunately, for mm. 30 years, we haven't had an industrial policy. And PLI, I'm sorry to say, and Make in India is not a manufacturing strategy. That's what you need. Okay. Because Dr. the jobs Kiyanazani, are not... Will you like to respond to that? Am I audible? Yes. Yeah. So, see, the question uh, you asked, is these 10 lakh jobs being created because the private no, Dr. sector... Dr. Hiranandani, Tushar, I'll okay. come to you in just a bit. Okay. Uh, well, uh, the issue is very clear that uh, uh, whether we look at the economy in terms of an external intervention which has taken place just now, where I think the government really doesn't have too much control over it, but as a long-term strategy, which Mr. Mehrotra just mentioned about, I think is a very critical factor. Not only industrial strategy, it's an overall HRD issues and employment strategy that needs to be done because agriculture is 
definitely an underemployment area and more and more people need to shift out of it. So we have to look at the sectors which really take employment. I'm only into one of those sectors, so I can tell you, we can really, really grow the number of people who can be employed in the construction real estate sector. We could probably absorb hmm. a crore of jobs easily every year, but not the unskilled ones. We need the skilled ones and we are grossly deficient. Now, we can identify so many other sectors in this matter also, which are going to be productive-oriented uh, uh, part of it. Uh, this kind of movement that needs to be done and done by government, private sector, we can do it in FIKI, CII, ISOCHAM, all these institutions, we can sit together and really do what we need to do. Hmm. So, all in all, we need to take a humongous effort, a war kind of effort, like we did the Green Revolution, we need to do an employment revolution and say labor intensive. See, up till now, when we talk about GDP growth, we talk about capital investment. That could be not necessarily uh, employment oriented. Hmm. So we need to also see how do we do it. And the last but not the least, very hmm. important, the services sector is growing. So I think the emphasis on the services sector also needs to be taken up in a bigger way. So we need a wartime effort. The private sector must participate. Government sectors need to encourage it. And the education sector is very responsible and we need to push it to the core. <laughs> Not only the IITs and IIMs, but the right, the, uh, the, the, hmm. right, the skilling at the lowest level, it becomes very, very critical in the mass employment that we need to hmm. do today. Interesting. I think an important takeaway is employment revolution is something that India really needs right now. Dr. Mehrutra wants to respond, but before that, Mr. Tushar Gupta, who's been waiting for quite some time, you know, what uh, Dr. Mehrutra also mentioned earlier was very important, Mr. Tushar Gupta, that this crisis, unemployment crisis that we are trying to handle today actually was there even before pandemic came into our lives. Absolutely. See, we have been slow on reforms. The government, even with all the best intention, has been slow on reforms. And I think one thing we all can agree on is that we need to push people away from agriculture. So how do we reimagine jobs in agriculture? Mm. Let's look at logistics. Let's look at warehousing, cold storage, transportation. You have the open network for digital commerce coming up. That will open a lot of jobs in the value-added services, again, in the logistics sector. You have the national infrastructure pipeline. You have the production-linked incentive schemes, which have already gotten investment of, of around rupees 2.34 lakh crore. So my, quest, my, my point is that the government, apart from filling up the vacancies and these, this is a very small number. They need to enable an atmosphere where jobs can be created at a breathtaking pace. They cannot go slow on reforms now. They have the mandate. And your question, what, is the private sector not keeping up with the job creation? Pick up India's five biggest airports right now. You go outside the airports, the total number of Uber, Ola, and other cab aggregated drivers would be one lakh already. So compared to that, the government's hiring numbers are pretty small. But again, we need the government to go big on reforms, on the farm reforms, labor reforms, power reforms, everything. Just create an atmosphere where businesses can flourish, where employment can be created. And farm laws, I, I feel very strongly about it, was one such step towards the right direction, pushing people away from agriculture to the value-added services. That would have done a lot good for the economy. Okay. Dr. Mehrotra wanted to come in, then Mr. Narayan. Yeah, I wanted to make a very specific point about skilling. I think Mr. Irunani is rightly emphasizing it. The problem with the government strategy <clears throat> in respect of skilling for the last 10 years has been the following. I've done a lot of work on this. I wrote the chapter for the 12th five-year plan on, on employment as well as skill development. And I've made this suggestion then and it still holds true today, which is unfortunate. You see, the problem with the, with the government approach to skill development is, is that it tends to be government-managed, government-financed, and government-driven. And that's a supply-driven program. It, skilling needs to be a demand-driven program, employer-driven program, industry-driven program. That, it's in countries where you have an a industry-driven program that skill development is demand-driven because only employers and industry know what are the jobs that are in demand, what are the skills that are in demand. The government does not know, but the government pretends that it knows. 
Now, that's where the industry's role comes in. So, so shouldn't the private players be playing a bigger role in this, Dr. Mehrdoz? Thank you. That's if exactly indeed the, skilling may I, needs to may be may demand I, driven. I, I, let, me, let me finish, Vahina. I was I'm going to reinforce the point that you're about to make and uh, that Mr. Hirnani was making. You see, it's very good to hear that Mr. Hirnani's firm actually does some in house training. Trouble is, most of our big corporates mm -hmm. don't do in house, in firm training. Enterprise-based training is not a norm, even in our corporates, let alone our SMEs. I think we have to make sure that policy is such that we incentivize that employers, industry, are, and then government has to recognize that it needs to bring in employers and industry in the process of choice of courses, in the process of determining the content and the syllabus of courses. Then in industry needs to bring it, come, come in for internships and apprenticeships. And then em employers mm. should also be providing trainers themselves. There is a very severe shortage of trainers in our country. In all these ways, employers need to be brought in. But this is a role of the government which, is, which, should, which should be facilitating all this. If it was facilitating all this, and, do, and if, if the focus of the PLI shifted to more labor-intensive sectors like wood and furniture, like food processing, as Mr. Tushar Gupta rightly mentioned, like um, garments, like textiles, like leather and footwear. These are the five manufacturing sectors which generate 50% of manufacturing jobs in our country. Now, if we were to mm. focus on these, then private sector jobs will grow, especially in the SMEs. And thankfully, mm. construction is growing, but construction, as, as was pointed out, they're short of skilled people. But who's going to do the skilling? Mm. Clearly, the industry employ the government is failing to do so. So, you know, the, the, the mantle mm. has to fall upon employers and industry. Hmm. Very, very interesting point. And I'm really happy to have this debate tonight because we've got some very good ideas that can actually bring this employment revolution that India really needs to tackle its unemployment crisis immediately. Mr. Anant Naran, I want to give you the last word. And two points I want you to focus on. One, uh, the you know uh, example that has been given that if indeed skilling has to be demand-driven instead of, uh, you know, giving incentives to industry on a lot of other issues, maybe on skilling, can there be some incentives from the government side? Can that lead to job creation that the country needs right now? Because there are jobs. Companies want people. There are people in this country who want jobs, but there is a mismatch because of lack of skills. Second, uh, do you think with the kind of announcement that has come from the government side, that's also sort of a direction that the center has given which can be followed, like we can take it forward from here and have this timeline sort of a thing in terms of creating jobs? Sure, uh, great question, uh, Hina. Let me try and put this all together um, and, and address the two specific points that you raised as well. Look, uh, I think employment creation and generation is clearly the biggest priority and issue for the country today. All the macroeconomic variables that we're interested in, whether it's growth, whether it's inflation, whether it's our external balance, whether it's our fiscal balance, ultimately depend upon us creating enough jobs and output in this country. That is the bottom line. What you're seeing from the announcement as a, from the government today is, I think, a reflection and understanding that, yes, employment creation is important. Okay. Now, the second point I want to make is that actually India has a great opportunity at this point in time. Of course, we have tons of problems. There's no shortage of problems. I speak to global investors, Hina. I can tell you that because of this China plus one, the fact that there is so much of over-dependence on supply chains from China, people do want to, to come out of China. Now, um, of course, you have countries like Vietnam, et cetera, which don't necessarily have scale in terms of buying capacity. Other emerging markets are also falling short. Brazil is falling short. Turkey is falling short. South Africa, Indonesia, everybody's falling short. India is a natural choice to come to. So even if you don't have any great positives, people are looking at India and are willing to invest into India. But there are several challenges. And uh, skilling is one of them, but I'll come to that. First, you have to have good infrastructure. You have to have connectivity from the hinterland to the ports. You need a deep sea port. You need to have the ecosystem for the power, et cetera, to be able to create large amount of goods and services. Second, you know, you need reforms to be done. Imagine somebody trying to set up a factory in India, buying 500 acres to set up a large factory. If they can do it in five years, this land acquisition, they are lucky. 
We have 45 million cases pending in our courts, which will take 300 odd years to, to clear out, uh, you know, a lot of them to do with land titles. God help anybody who's trying to set up an industry in this country. That has to be cleaned out, right? So the reforms that, that, that Tushar mentioned as well, uh, land reforms, labor reforms, uh, you know, contract enforcement has to be done. Third is in terms of, you know, uh, actually privatization. I think it's an important part of, of, of trying to get more productivity in this country. Fourth, of course, is, you know, uh, things like incentives just to sweeten up the deal. Yes, you have handicaps. Let's get in money. And we provide you incentives as long as you're bringing in jobs and capital. The last part, which is on public services, which encompasses your skill. Look, yes, skilling has to be done by the private sector, but the basic infrastructure on basic education, basic healthcare, basic nutrition, hmm. that has to be provided by the state. What we set aside for basic education, for basic healthcare, unfortunately, is extremely low as a percentage of GDP compared to our peer countries. Unless we have 35% stunting statistics, um, uh, uh, you know, you know, 18% of our children are wasted. If between the age of zero to five, a hmm. child's brain is not given the chance to develop, no amount of training will ever get it to become a, a, an intelligent. Right. So that basic public services provision, the government's responsibility is absolute and it has to be done. Even if you have to eat grass, let's provide education, healthcare, and sanitation and public services. If we can get these things right, even 50% of them, right. we can create the jobs this country needs. Absolutely. Thank you very much, all of you gentlemen, uh, for joining us here on Urban Debate on this very, very important issue today. Some interesting suggestions have come. Thank you for the moment for joining us uh, this evening. With this, we will slip into a very, very short break. But on the other side, an exclusive conversation with former finance and home minister of the country, senior Congress leader, P. Chidamram, lined up. Stay with us.